Earth's atmosphere isn't constant. Physical processes such as volcanic eruptions and natural processes such as photosynthesis regularly release gas into the air, contributing to the makeup of the atmosphere. The atmosphere consists of the gases that float about above the crust. Early on in Earth's history, the gases in question don't neatly line up to what we have in the atmosphere now. In particular, there's much more free oxygen now than there was in the deep past. At the moment, oxygen consists of just about 20% of the atmosphere. But it seems that until 2.5 billion years ago, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere was insignificant, existing only in trace amounts. And about that time, there was a jump that brought the amount of oxygen up to about 1% of its modern level by about 2.2 billion years ago. This story of the oxygenation of our atmosphere is not a trivial one. It's argued that without it, the existence of larger life forms, possibly even as small as single-celled eukaryotes, and all the more so the later multi-celled organisms and the trilobites and ourselves, that we all could not exist without oxygen. We'll learn more about that when we come to understand these topics in later videos. But for now, we'll begin by casting our gaze to the early Earth, with a black crust peppered with volcanoes all spewing out molten rock and gas, with the gas emitted becoming the atmosphere. This volcano-borne atmosphere is theoretical, and a complication is the fact that 4.55 billion years ago, that's when Earth reached its differentiated state, and volcanic activity was the story of the entire surface, at that time, whatever gases were being released from Earth into the growing atmosphere mixed with gases that were coming from asteroids, which themselves contained volatiles. Perhaps in time we will observe the making of atmospheres on other planets and come to clarify and constrain our story further. An atmosphere created from volcanoes would consist mainly of nitrogen in the molecular form of N2, carbon dioxide, and inert gases, the noble gaseous elements that do not care for chemical connection because of their satiated valence shell of electrons, that outermost shell of electrons which are responsible for interacting with neighboring atoms to build molecules and minerals. Traces of other gases would have been there as well. Water vapor or H2O, methane or CH4, and hydrogen in the form of H2. Notably for our conversation, while there was oxygen in molecular form in combination with other atom types like H2O and CO2, oxygen was not yet going it alone. This atmosphere is called oxygen-free in that sense, but there seems to be something incomplete about this picture of the early atmosphere. Here's the problem. Our understanding of our sun's evolution has it that early on in Earth's history, the sun was only about 70% as strong as it is today. With time, it built up stronger and stronger, but it stayed that weak 70% as powerful as today for some time. And if that's the case, by 4.4 billion years ago, when Earth had oceans, it's true that Earth may have been able to maintain some heat for a short time because of the greater store of inner heat and the heat being added from the remaining asteroid impacts. But this could not have kept Earth's surface hot enough for liquid for too long, and eventually the liquid should have frozen over. And yet, it doesn't seem to have done so, so the question is why? The answer is something of a shrug, although it may be that methane is what explains this. In our atmosphere, carbon dioxide, with the help of some other molecules, helps keep sunlight from escaping into space from Earth. Carbon dioxide would have played that same role early on, but a vulcanogenic atmosphere wouldn't consist of a sufficient amount of CO2 to keep Earth sufficiently warm for water. It may be that carbon dioxide was produced much more than we currently think, but another idea is that methane, CH4, may have been introduced into the atmosphere from some of the earliest forms of life. And methane is a far more effective greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, 20 times as potent in preventing Earth's heat from escaping. So if we had methane being pumped into the atmosphere, that may well make sense of why early Earth did not freeze over. But getting methane into the atmosphere at this specific time in history is only theory, and it's a specific type of life, a lithotroph, that would have been creating it. There are two basic ways of getting food as a life form. You can produce it yourself, building up the molecules you need for life from more basic units, and then you're an autotroph, or you can consume external food and then break it down into the parts you need, and if you do that, you're a heterotroph. Some of the simplest life forms are autotrophs, and some contend that the earliest life forms would have been autotrophic, although this isn't a majority view. The most basic autotrophs get their energy from rocks, so they're known as lithotrophs, and they use that chemical energy from the rock to help build what they need. Lithotrophs in this process produce a waste product, and that waste product is methane, which just might be our early Earth savior. So if methanogenic life formed early on, and pumped methane into the atmosphere. Perhaps that explains why Earth didn't freeze over. 
But if this is true, then of course, when considering the developing history of our early atmosphere prior to the introduction of oxygen, there's a stage of growing amounts of methane which helped keep the planet sufficiently warm. Methane or not, the early atmosphere was oxygen-free. The initial great giveaway of this early oxygenless period came from the fact that there are minerals that appeared in rocks older than about 2 billion years ago, but not in rocks from later than that period. Specifically, grains of pyrite, uraninite, and siderite. These minerals contain either iron and or uranium that isn't oxidized, and that doesn't happen in younger sedimentary rocks because such elements are rapidly oxidized in an oxygenated atmosphere. So this shows that way back in time there wasn't oxygen in the atmosphere. Since this discovery, plenty of further evidence has been discovered and laid out, you could learn about it further in the links below. But one of these other forms of evidence comes in the form of banded iron formations. These formations are interesting in that the iron in these formations wouldn't be soluble enough in the deep ocean to form in sedimentary rocks if there was oxygen around. Instead, it requires an oxidized shallower ocean and an anoxic deeper ocean. So the decline of these banded iron formations, or BIFs, from 2.5 to 1.85 billion years ago demonstrates the increase in oxygen, with oxygen eventually reaching the ocean floor by 1.85 billion years ago, such that these formations can no longer form. The Great Oxygenation Event itself refers to a window in this larger growth of oxygen period. And it's a window where Earth's atmosphere goes from being oxygenless to having plenty of oxygen in the form of O2, two oxygen atoms connected in molecular form. The time periods vary some, but from 2.5 to 2.1 billion years ago seems to be a good capturing of the gist of it, although the bottom of one or more of the oceans remained oxygenless until 1.85 billion years ago. The oxygen that we're seeing that's emerging at this point is thought to have come from cyanobacteria, bacteria that photosynthesize, producing oxygen as a waste product. It's unclear exactly when photosynthetic organisms first emerged, with some arguing for an origin around 3.5 billion years ago, and many only sold in later evidence from about 2.7 billion years ago. If 3.5 is the number, then why there aren't signs of much oxygen until 2.5 billion years ago is odd and calls for an explanation. And if 2.7 billion years ago is the origin of cyanobacteria, that seems to fit far more neatly with the oxygen buildup we detect in the rock record. Once this oxygen was released into the atmosphere, unfortunate consequences are thought to have arisen for much of the existing life. Life until then is thought to have been anaerobic, and oxygen is toxic to them. So this great oxygenation event is likely to have also been a great extinction event, arguably the first or second great extinction event in Earth life's history. The death knell that Earth became at that time was further exacerbated, as the oxygen in the air reacted with the methane to produce water and carbon dioxide, thus weakening the greenhouse effect on Earth and sending Earth into its first ice age. The intensity of the ice age of this Huronian glaciation is debated due to the dearth of remaining deposits from this time. Up until around 575 million years ago, this story remains much the same. While there remain many bumps in the timeline to be fleshed out and the history of oxygen is far more complicated than just this one increase, this major increase marks the introduction of oxygen as a feature of our atmosphere. But it was still far less than what we have now. For the next major increase, we'll encounter that when we encounter the Ediacaran period. But now, with oxygen in the atmosphere, and photosynthetic bacteria near shores feeding off the sun, and Earth getting at least partially covered with ice, and much of the early generation of life dying out, the earthy part of Earth remains barren. In the water there was life, but only single-celled eubacteria and archaea. For eukaryotes, for sexual reproduction, for multicellularity, none of that yet was. Until next time, to the history of everything, to big history, to our story.